Get your benefits. This is the focus group. They're all business, except when they're not. It's the focus group with Tim Bennett and John Nash. Hey, welcome to the Focus Group. John Nash here with my good friend and co-host, Mr. Tim Bennett. And I just got us right, Tim and John, left and right. Um, FocusGroupRadio.com is the URL for our website, and that's all you need to know about us and the show, including our Tuesday podcast, TFG Unbuttoned. Uh, And as I said, FocusGroupRadio.com, everything's there, including links to our partners and sponsors. And later on, we're going to have a little segment with our good friends from Deep Discount, so get your shopping fingers ready for that. Uh, Tim, thank you for your help in, uh, in opening the show. I was struggling to say the headline that we'll be talking about in Shop Talk later in the broadcast, which is that the Social Security Administration is now actually retroactively going back and giving survivor benefits to uh, same-sex couples who can prove that they were together and who lost their partner at some point in time. Um, it's kind of an interesting thing because the only way to do that that we know of was to have legal marriage, but now they're actually looking at some of these partnerships as long-term much like a common, uh, what do they call it? A common, common, common law common marriage. Law marriage. Yeah. 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 No, I was, well, it's a good story. So I'm glad you found it. So, Hey, before we get going, um, last week, Tim did a really great business birthday. Um, and one of our listeners out in Chicago, Chris sent us a note with some photographs and he said the following and in fact it was the birthday the business birthday tim did was about bessie coleman who was one of the first african-american women flyers she was a pilot and she'd had a tragic death she um plummeted to her death in an accident uh, p- plane went into a tailspin co-pilot was in the plane he died as well but she fell almost two thousand feet if i remember correctly So um, Chris from Chicago writes, I never really gave much thought to Bessie Coleman Drive until your business birthday segment. It was simply a road I needed to take to get to work. I had to ask around and found out there is, in fact, an exhibit at O'Hare located in O'Hare International Airport located in Terminal 2. It's not a statue, but it's a start. And so he uh, he sent us some photographs as well. So there's a display at O'Hare about Bessie Coleman. Some of these pictures Tim had actually found for the, uh, for our car, for his business birthday. So she is memorialized. There is a road at, named after her at the O'Hare airport, which is kind of amazing. And, uh, there you go, Tim. Wow. Yeah. I had somebody, uh, another friend contact me too about the birthday and they were meeting with a, a woman from the air force that was a flyer. And, um, they were going to use the business birthday as kind of, they were meeting for the first time. So they're going to use it to break the ice. You know, it's one of those people that we don't, you know, you don't know about, right? So it's it's always good to, or we didn't know about her. I didn't know about her. And in listening, or you driving to these your, roads, yeah. yeah. You don't. And in listening to the show over the weekend, um, you know, you said something funny. You said, you know, if you're going to have statues of people, why not have a statue of Bessie Coleman? There's no yeah. controversy. She was cool, right? <laughs> she was yeah. a groundbreaker. She she did something before anybody else did. So why not have her be a statue? Yeah. Yeah. So, hey, did you watch any football over the weekend? No, you know, but I, was, I didn't. I, I picked Cincinnati. I didn't think they were going to make it. They did. But you you said that last week. I remember here you said that. And of course, the it's the L.A. Rams versus Cincinnati, correct? Yeah, I had uh, one of our listeners in Rehoboth here, Rob. He had sent a note right away after they won. Said, "I knew you were backing them. <laughs> they were down three to twenty one going into the 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 uh, second half. So the fact that they came back." They have this young quarterback, one of the youngest of all times, 25 years old, Joe Burrows, from southeastern Ohio. So there was a, a, a southeastern Ohio connection as well. Um, so anyway, pretty cool. So it'd be exciting. Hopefully the Super Bowl's exciting this year. I know we'll talk about probably next week some of the advertising that's there and not there. I was going to ask you about that offline. We might as well say it right now, though. Did we feel like having like Mike or Stuart on or someone to talk about some of the ads for next week? We could. Yeah, certainly. It'd be a good idea. I, I Just, maybe it's me and maybe it's because I'm not paying attention to some of that chatter, but I don't I'm not getting a lot of like, you know, crazy excitement over the Super Bowl ads this year, unless you and I are so far off that thing. I, I don't think we are, but no, there's certainly not. You're exactly right. I've, I've been looking and I, I went through a list of who's in, who's out, who's new, who's come back. And uh, th- th- there will be a lot of social commentary they expect. 
I don't even know who's doing the halftime show. No, neither do I. Neither do I. But as I get older, I don't know, you know, unless it's, was it one year who did it? Carol Channing. Can you imagine? <laughs> <laughs> no, I can't. What did she sing? Like, Hello, Dolly or something? It I was mean... like the first Super Bowl, I think, or one of the first few. And then they had Up With People, you know, that called. <laughs> Did, did you see do. them in Southbury? Did they come to your school to perform? Of course they did. They were trying. They were, yeah. they were coming to what do they call that? Postulate? What is it when they come to? Oh, proselytize. To to get, proselytize. Whatever. What does postulate mean? I don't know. Anyway, they came to try to recruit that, and then the <laughs> army band would come through. You know, come on, kids, <laughs> yeah. come one, come all. All right. So here's another question for you. Um, have you heard of this game that everybody's playing called Wordle? W o r d l e. Yeah, I played it the other day, and I got angry. How'd you do? How'd you do? Angrily, I did not do well. I didn't know what to do, because there were, I didn't think it was very well um, defined what I was supposed to do, but I don't like to read directions, so that could have been the issue. <laughs> but I started just typing in letters, because, you know, it's 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 essentially it's another version of uh, Wheel of Fortune. Yeah, but well, what people don't like is everyone is the same word, right? Yes, yeah. That's Everybody the gets thing. One and, word a day. One word a day. Right, and it's 24 hours, so that's, I don't know. Another thing we didn't come up with, John. Well, I we've been playing it, and I think it all hinges on the very first word you choose. There's, there, If you are lucky enough to get a couple consonants and vowels, then you're on your way. I got the word yesterday in three tries. What was the Bob word? Bob got it in six. I, I, I think it was, um, I'd have to look at it up. But like once I do it, I forget it. But there have been some days where I haven't gotten it, and I've been really pissed off. So <laughs> I was mad. I missed the, when I, the one time I played it was sugar was the word. Okay, and and I don't know why I screwed around with it so badly, but I couldn't. Uh, I wasn't able unable to uh, to get it done. So well, whatever. So uh, we mentioned on unbuttoned earlier our Tuesday podcast that um, I was due to visit Tim in Rehoboth this weekend, but we we wisely paid attention to the storm, and Tim got way more snow <laughs> than we did in upstate New York. I mean, we got like maybe two inches, and it blew around. It was that fluffy stuff. And I know you're still digging out, but um, I think when the temps hit like down there, it's going to be 50 something on Wednesday, Thursday, Thursday. Right? Yeah. It's supposed to be in the high fifties, which, and then rain, which I hope it does. Cause it's, it gets snow's nice for about, for anyone who doesn't get snow, it's nice f- until it gets messed up and people start walking on it and shovel and then it becomes dirty. It's just nasty. black snow, the, the black Brown snow. We have it all over New York. It was pretty for a bit when we pulled in last night. I was like, ah, ah, the winter, here we go. Yeah. It's pretty, pretty for a little while. And that's it. All right. So with that, on, on that note, what caught your eye? What caught your eye? Here's what Tim and John found. So this story popped up. I don't know. You might have heard about it before, but uh, I don't know if you have or not. But it popped up about Prince Andrew. Oh, and I have heard this one. I'm glad you're doing this. So a, there was a headline, and then I did some more research to find out more about it. And the story just, the story just got creepier as we went along. But P- Prince Andrew's former maid had a day-long training session on how to arrange his collection of 72 teddy bears. Apparently, this is still going on. So um, he had a maid named Charlotte Briggs who worked for Buckingham Palace in the 90s. And she had, she had in a, a recent book she had she written, she revealed that one of the oddest parts of her job was spending an hour each day arranging Prince Andrew's collection of teddy bears. And it was a very meticulous, it was very meticulous order uh, about how these bears needed to be presented and how they needed to look. She said, as soon as she got the job, I was told about the teddies and it was drilled into <laughs> me how he wanted them. It was drilled into me how he wanted them handled and taken care of. I even had a day's training. Everything had to be just right. It was so peculiar, she said. She said there were 72 bears from around the globe, many of them dressed in sailors outfits. <laughs> so uh then they talked to sarah ferguson about it and she just laughed so and sarah she, knew, ferguson, she knew about this oh yeah well as, as because when she started dating him so sarah ferguson his former wife the uh the duke and duchess, the of, duchess york, of york when they were married right? duchess of york right she said in 1986 to 1982 she laughed about the bizarre collection so she said she wasn't a fan of the teddy bears but when they got married and there's a picture of the carriage uh, there is a picture that you can find um, if you Google it. But when you, when they got married, she had a huge teddy bear in the, in the carriage with them. And everybody thought it was just a fun little gift. But I guess he wanted this teddy bear. She got this teddy bear with him to to, to trot down the, 
the avenue and you know with the wedding party. So they said it was no secret that he had a that uh, he's had a long pension for the soft uh, toys. Multiple insiders reveal that um, he kept dozens of them at the private residence, and uh, he also had, along with the seventy-two teddy bears, a hippo and a panther, thrown in for good measure. And he's gone to very extreme lengths to protect them. They said uh, his fixation on on stuffed animals lasted throughout the marriage to Fergie. And uh, recently they said she was asked about it and she fell on the floor laughing because a <laughs> royal biographer had questioned her about the collection. She said that, uh, yeah, it was a thing. And uh, when he initially had told her about it, she thought he was kidding. But no, in fact, he was very, um, very serious about it. And she, another person had come through the palace recently and asked if they were from Princess Beatrix and Princess Eugenie. And he said, no, they were mine. And someone came in the palace and saw these teddy bears. So he, um, someone said, no way, they're Andrews. And they said, yes, they were. And everybody, you know, laughed. So he had said, or he explains it about how he what, got this What does he say quantity. about this? He says, everywhere I went in the Navy, Navy, I used to buy a little teddy bear. So when he, he was part of the British, uh, the British Navy. And so he would travel around the world and he would buy a teddy bear wherever he went. Now, most people collect spoons or salt and pepper shakers. I guess he got teddy bears. And uh, so he said he has these bears from all over the world. He, re he revealed that in an interview um, in 2010. They said that uh, he is fiercely protective of the bears collection, and he orders the royal servants to arrange them in specific patterns, as we mentioned. There's also a ritual at night. And uh, so when you do start and you work for him, you have to get a laminated card with a diagram as to where the bears are. Uh, this is placed. the part that I read. Um and he it's a very precise layout right for the for yeah, the bear she was so charlotte briggs said she was expected to organize the collection uh around his four poster bed by size the larger bears were in the back the smaller ones up front and in the evening she'd have to move some of the teddies in preparation for his arrival so she said she'd have to place the little bears in an unused fireplace and position the two favorite toys on each side of his bed she said it was very odd after all, this was a grown man who had served in the Falklands. <laughs> I mean, you can't enough, make it up, can you? En enough said, right? I mean, it just... I my uh, Caught my eye for me could not be more different and, and just so different from Andrew and his teddy bear collection. So I came across this... Um, this article and the headline reads forget batteries this 100 year old technique provides cheap energy storage for wind and solar power and the picture that i put up here if you're watching on on youtube is um a, a, the top picture is a picture of a man-made lake in germany and then below it are some diagrams for how this thing works so at first i thought maybe there was some kind of special salt water in the pond that was uh, making the water warmer than normal so that they could use the temperature temperature differential to generate electricity or or something like that but no it was actually much simpler than that what they do is they're looking all around the world for sites to do this where they basically create two man-made lakes one that's about 1900 feet higher than the other one and during the day um the a solar there's a solar collector or it could be wind power pumps you, powers pumps that take water up to the upper pond and at night and for whenever they need to that water is released and it runs downhill and it spins turbines to make electricity and i was kind of really fascinated by this because i thought well if you're using water to pump up if you're using power to pump the water up to the upper lake and then you're just running the water down. Is it, isn't it like a zero sum game, but it turns out, no, a pair of 250 acre reservoirs with an altitude difference of 600 meters, that's the 1900 feet between the two of them, can store 24 gigawatt hours of energy, meaning the system could supply one gigawatt of power for 24 hours, which is enough to, for a city of a million people for 24 hours. And then the water can cycle infinitely up and down. They've even had this, they even are dealing with techniques where they, they cover that both water sources with these floating things that reflect the sun so the water doesn't evaporate that easily so they, they have a constant amount of water but i was really just totally taken by this i'm like how simple is this you pump water uphill into a pond 
when you need it, you release it and it generates electricity and the electricity needed to pump it uphill is a fraction of what it, of a, what you're making to have it flow downhill. It's such a simple thing, right? Holy crow nerd alert. I just scrolled right by <laughs> this. You, this is complicated. <laughs> well, don't you think it's fascinating though? No, it's complicated. <laughs> what I thought this was going to be one of these things where you run the water through the peat, you know, people fill up their pond with peat moss like the artisans did. They fill up their pool with peat moss and run the water through and it heats the house. I thought it was one of those things. This is yeah, quite that, yeah. quite complicated. I wonder well, why they don't do, I wonder why we don't do it. It says in all the amount of water needed to support a 100% renewable electricity system is about 3 liters per person per day, which is equivalent to 20 seconds of a morning shower. So when you look at when we look at solutions for some of our energy problems, some some of them are just staring us in the face like I don't know. And, and yes, are you going to build? Are you going to build a pond up in the back of your yard? Because you do have that land. You have the hill. You can probably put well, a pond up in the back. You realize the difference uh, of the upper pond and the lower pond being nineteen hundred feet. That is three hundred feet taller than the Empire State Building. So you'd have to have a pond that was an altitude change of almost higher than the height of the Empire State Building, which is which is not, you know, so unless you're in the Alps, probably not going to happen. Or Colorado. <laughs> yeah. And they've and they've looked around the world for for sites that they can do this with. And they've located a few. But you've just identified one of the problems. Not every site is perfect for this. I mean, you could find a mountain range, but it might be far away from people or something. So, yes, nerd alert number one million and something. But you hey, look, you learned, right? I, well, let's listen, laugh, and learn. I'm just, you know, it, it seems to me to have been a complicated story. You know, I've got an attention span of a gnat, so I'd have gone in about a paragraph or two and then said, okay, next. <laughs> because that, that looked very complicated. How you mean a little was diagram? Article? Yeah, how long was that article? Oh, it was much longer than this. This was in Fast, Fast Company. And so you, you think, so the diagram, I'm back at, if you're on YouTube, there's a little diagram on the right. That's a, that's a system that is in a closed loop. The water moves between two. You can do this system with a river and other things, but to be truly ecologically friendly, I think they're looking at doing it with two separate man-made ponds. But yeah, it. Sorry. Well, hey, we no, all learned. Okay. No, hey, my listen, father, my, my my yeah, my father still. You know, they wanted to harness the tides out of Nova Scotia, the Bay of Fundy, out mm -hmm. in New Brunswick. My God, think and about they, it. Yeah, they said you could essentially power Eastern Canada and most of the Northeast of the U.S. if they could figure out how to harness the tides, but. It, I guess it's just too expensive, but they have the highest tides in the world. They go in and out yep. over fifty feet within the within the the uh, the cycle of the tides. But I, I don't know how you would do that. I guess you'd have to put turbines out in the uh, ocean or something. <laughs> well, in other words, all this caught my eye. Says it's above your pay grade, right? Yeah. Well, <laughs> it was all right though. <laughs> all right, folks. As uh, many of you know. Deep Discount is a partner of ours here on the Focus Group, and we would love you to shop at their site by going to rsfocusgroupradio.com and clicking on the Deep Discount logo to begin your shopping spree and to go down the rabbit hole. We love Deep Discount because you can find almost anything you want there. And trust me, if there's a show or movie that you haven't seen in a long time, go to Deep Discount first and check it out because chances are they probably have it. Um, I'm amazed at the, at the inventory and the depth of the catalog. So this week is a uh, we're featuring a TV crime and medicine sale, and uh, so all of us know, like you know, Quincy MD could be up here if that was still available. But uh, and we know there's plenty of TV crime shows. So, having said that, Mr. Bennett, what did you pick this week? So I picked uh, it was released in June of 2020, and this is one of these. I know you all laughed at me, you and Lauren, our friend at, uh, at <laughs> Deep Discount. Deep Discount. When I, I never watched um, The Godfather, I never watched uh, Six Feet Under, which which I wanted to do. And another another series that was so hot at the time uh, was The Sopranos. And uh, so Deep Discount has the complete series on DVD. It's six seasons, and uh, it revolves around the crime family and kind of how they balance life in the crime organization that uh, they guided. And I know I would used to hear people at work talking about it every week about what happened and, and how the story was evolving. Did you ever watch The Sopranos? We've watched it about three times from start wow. to finish. When Matt Bogart, our producer, who some of you saw a couple of weeks ago, uh, I uploaded the incorrect file to Facebook and uh, we had a little pre-show dialogue with our producer who was helping us with this new software. That's Matt, our producer, and he is a huge Sopranos fan. Tim, he may send you a note chiding you for not having seen this sooner 
I feel bad. I feel un-American. I mean, I missed a lot of things. I don't re <laughs> really watch a lot of TV, and uh, this, I believe, was when it initially came out. Was it HBO? Yeah, it, it always was HBO. Yeah, it's an amazing yeah. show. It's. And it's... I, I would never pay for HBO. <laughs> <laughs> well, but you would pay for this, right? Yeah. Well, so th I thought here's an opportunity because uh, it, it, it uh, is a great price. It's the full collection. It's about a hundred and two hundred and three dollars, and. Uh, it has all the complete series and some great actors in it. And I just, so since you liked it, and if, you, if you've watched it three times, you've liked it. It's like you would doubt Nabby. I haven't watched that either, by the way. Oh my God. We were just at the Abbey last night. We do, when we, when we get tired of the news, we sometimes just turn on a random episode of Down Abbey because anything's better at the night in 1925 <laughs> than what's going on right now. All right, well, uh, I also chose a TV series, although this one was from Showtime that I did not see, and it's called uh, Masters of Sex, the Complete Series. So it's based on um, actual events. Uh, the series details the work of Dr. William Masters and his assistant, Virginia Johnson, so this is the Masters and Johnson, researchers whose extensive studies into the complexities of human sexuality at Washington University in the late 1950s broke new ground and made them pioneers in the field. Um, I had been meaning to see it or trying to see it, but like you, I didn't feel like I wanted to subscribe to Showtime to see it. So I would put this on my list at uh, 3729 for the complete series. There's, I think there's eight discs. It did get good reviews. So that one, that one does intrigue me. And I, I think I want to see that. So uh, the release this week is Mr. Bennett. It's the Beatles get back. On um, Blu-ray, and I've heard lots of good things about this. I uh, I was listening to, I'm a fan of Morning Joe sometimes, but uh, <laughs> Joe Scarborough, who shares the same birthday and same age as me, I don't know if that's good or bad. He uh, he talks about this a lot. He loves this uh, in-depth look at the Beatles, and um, he just can't say knife a lot of he couldn't say enough good things about it. So I was never. A big huge Beatles, Beatles fan. fan. I was mm. more Rolling Stones, I guess, but I, I, I think that might be our age. I don't know. Uh, there's certainly a lot of people my age or, or, or younger that like the Beatles. Were you a big Beatles fan? You know, I was introduced to the Beatles when um, Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Heart Club, Hearts Club band was out, and probably that was all before that was might have been Yellow Submarine and some of their movies. So I did like a lot of their music, but I wasn't a big, big, huge fan. Um, right. But obviously I see the appeal. I mean, they, they were one of the biggest bands ever. Right. And they, they influenced rock and roll. Like you can't believe. And the whole idea of passionately following a band, remember how the girls used to go screaming crazy right. when they landed at an airport or something. But yeah, I, um, I, I, from a history point of view, I would love this and I might, I probably like it from the music point of view, but, uh, yeah, you're right about Joe Scarborough. He was literally talking about it the other day. So, yeah. So they, they had, they have over 60 hours of footage that they, they used to uh, put this together. It's, it's, uh, revolves around the 1970, uh, album they were doing and, uh, was it let it be? Yeah. I think, or no. Uh, and anyway, so it's, um, there's archival footage. It's toward what they call the end of when they were all together, and uh, but the brilliance in terms of them as writers and musicians really comes through in this, from what everyone says. So, um, I, I think uh, I think you're right. Historically, I think it'd be fun to watch. So be sure to uh, head over to Deep Discount and get the Beatles. It's uh, the Beatles Get Back is the new release this week on Blu-ray, and you can get it by going to focusgroupradio.com and click on the Deep Discount logo. Start shopping away. Uh, John also recommended this week um, during the metal, uh, medical drama, our TV crime and medical drama sale. John recommended The Masters of Sex, and I recommended The Sopranos. So again, head over to focusgroupradio.com, click on the deep discount logo. We're going to take a quick break. When we come back, we've got uh, Business Birthday and a little shop talk that uh, John uh, had uh, alluded to earlier about Social Security benefits and uh, people that were... Uh, in non-married relationships that can now hopefully claim. So stay with us. You're listening to The Focus Group with Tim and John. Learn more at focusgroupradio.com. Now, back to the focus group with Tim and John. 
available pretty much everywhere. Hey, welcome back to the Focus Group. John Nash with Tim Bennett. Find us at focusgroupradio.com. And you could also check out our other podcast, TFG Unbuttoned. 20 minutes, three stories. They're usually kind of interesting. I should not I should rephrase that. They're always interesting because we make them interesting, right, Tim? We have to be more right. assertive about that. So, get out. <laughs> so there you go. Um, and without further ado, I think we need to have the business birthday. Everyone does celebrity birthday greetings, but the focus group is the only show in the universe that celebrates business birthdays. So aside from my niece, Amanda, who was born on February 2nd, um, happy born birthday, on this, Amanda. Yeah. On this day, I don't think she listens. I know her <laughs> fiance she does, does. She'll have a happy birthday. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, the, uh, the birthday today is Howard Deering Johnson or Howard Johnson, of course. Uh, born February 2nd, 1897. He died in June of 72 at 75 years old. An American entrepreneur, businessman, and the founder of the American chain of restaurants and motels under one company of the same name, Howard Johnson's. So he was born in Boston, Massachusetts. He finished elementary school, went and served in World War I. And uh, his father had died when he came back and left him in debt, essentially. Left him a cigar store in 1924. Jeez. And I tried to liquidate it, but there was still $10,000 worth of debt. So uh, he ended up um, buying a small soda shop in Quincy, Massachusetts, in order to help pay off the loan debt um, from his father's failed cigar venture. And so he buys this ice cream shop in 1925. And uh, then he had he was a huge fan of ice cream. So he enhanced the uh, quality of the ice cream he had. He bought some recipes off a push cart vendor for $300. And then he doubled the butter fat of the product and used only natural flavorings. Wait, wait, wait. He doubled? <laughs> That's what's good. Well, listen, when you come down here and taste this ice cream from Kate, I feel bad. I had this maple walnut the other day as a sidebar. I feel like I'm 10,000 pounds. So, but she, it's like sugar, high, heavy cream, and flavoring, and that's it. But, um, and I said to her, I said, we can make some money on this. She goes, I'm not making ice cream. So, because I'm thinking we can get a push cart and sell some of this ice cream, John, down here. Make a couple All our bucks. plans always run into a wall. I'm not making ice cream. But I'm not delicious. making ice cream. So well, maybe we'll have to give her $300 for the recipes. So anyway, he doubled the butter fat, and um, he used a hand crank maker in the basement. And by this is why, Kate and John, we need to make ice cream. You know I worked at Baskin Robbins. In 1928, he was grossing $240,000 from the ice cream. He sold at this nearby beaches. It's pretty good. Grossing per year, per week, per month. Uh, so by 1928, he was grossing 240,000 from ice cream sold. It must be for during the season, is my guess. But you said right, 19. Beaches, what was it? 19. 1928. Yeah, that that would be a lot of money in today's money. And today's in dollars, if you rank that, if you you know, probably 1.2 million. Million. There you go. Might, might you as well and I that. will. I'll put on a little hat and in a in a sailor outfit and sell ice cream. <laughs> Anyway, Johnson expanded the operations. He opened up a few more stores, started selling hamburgers. I always love this. We call them hot dogs. They call them frankfurters. Frankfurters, the right. Is. Yeah. So in 1929, he opened up a second shop, and uh, he decided to have a sit-down sit down restaurant, which actually laid the groundwork for him. He teamed up with a, another guy named Reginald Sprague, and they opened up what became known as kind of the precursor or the first modern restaurant franchise, 1935, called Howard Johnson's. So the idea was that you would have, uh, you would franchise or sell, they didn't really use the word franchise, but you'd have an operator in a town, use the name, the food supplier, and the logo in exchange for a fee. So that's how the Hojo business or the Hojo train, uh, chain of restaurants had rapidly expanded. In the 1960s and 70s, it was the largest um restaurant chain around i didn't realize that did you did you know it was that big not at all and i mean i we were we all knew howard johnson's it was a big part of our vacation when we ever went down to the outer yeah. banks yeah that's state, that's when you always went yeah yeah hell joe's and we knew about the ice cream and it was the orange roof i had no idea they were such a big um big thing on the hospitality stage right 
Yeah, it was a, so it's the chain of restaurants for over 90 years, widely known for that alone. It was uh, the largest restaurant chain in the chain in the U.S. from the 60s and 70s with more than a thousand outlets, uh, some company owns and mostly franchised. And uh, it was sold to the Wyndham Hotels and Resorts, which still have license to all of the recipes and um, and most of the, uh, you know, the proprietary information and the, the brand ID. So I got an idea for you, John. There's a road trip in this. There's only one Howard Johnson's left in the world. And it's only in Lake one? George, New York. Right. Wait and a minute. So we can that's go like, there. You can that's go... like an hour and a half from our house. Two hours, right? Right. Lake George, New York. So you get... I used to love the fried clam strips. My brother always got the Spready Freddy, which was a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. <laughs> we always laugh. I'd always laugh Freddy. at my brother. Spready Freddy. Because we would stop at a Howard Johnson's either somewhere in the Massachusetts on our way to Maine. We'd always stop at a, a, a Hojo's, and my grandmother loved it. You know, the fried clams. I, anyway, going down a rat hole. But the uh, <laughs> we could go to the we can go up to Lake George and um, and go see uh, Howard Johnson's. Currently, the line of branded frozen food that they used to have, including the ice cream, is no longer manufactured. But Wyndham still controls and holds the name. He. Um, couple of uh odd things about him they said he had zero hobbies all he liked to do was eat and work which i think is kind of boring um obviously was a successful successful man was married four times had left the uh well that clearly was marriage was not clearly a hobby right no and then he used to drive around in a black cadillac chauffeured black cadillac to check you do spot you know spot uh inspections for cleanliness around the uh around the different restaurants in his older years they said he ate at least one ice cream cone a day. And he kept 10 distinct flavors of ice cream in the freezer at his seven-room Manhattan penthouse or at his home in Milton, Mass. And uh, they said he would tell people that it was, uh, even though he was a pretty heavy guy, they said that um, he pretty much said that ice cream didn't get, didn't, there was no problem eating ice cream, didn't gain any weight. <laughs> he said his favorite food was ice cream, which he uh, maintained was not fattening. Mm. He was, yeah, he was, he was, uh, he was a small guy, but over 200 pounds, he said. Anyway, I, um, and uh, his license plate was HJ, if you ever saw it in Manhattan, wandering around before he died. HJ 28, Howard Johnson's 28 for the ice cream flavors he had. So he died, buried in Milton, Mass, uh, Milton Cemetery, as I said, 1972. And, um, I mean, I think all of us of a certain age remember... Howard Johnson's, and you're exactly right. The only time you went was when you were on the road. Well, yeah, sure. We used to stay there, and I remember the placemats. We used to love the games on the placemats. Didn't they have a little like a little, like a little road you could drive? Wasn't it? Uh-huh. Um, you bet. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and my sisters were like, "When are we going to Hojo's?" Yeah. And I remember having Chris uh, birthday parties at Hojo's when Hojo the Clown would come in. I, in fact, I turned that into a whole routine in college. I don't know if you remember my Hojo the Clown. <laughs> hey kids, guess who's here? The van door opens. The clown. I didn't know you had a out. Christmas. I didn't know you had a birthday party there. Did no, you remember? Did you have one. a fa- Oh, did you have a favorite food there? Uh, no, we would we we always liked the ice cream, obviously. Um, but right. we, it was whatever we had. We uh, we were happy with whatever we had. If it was pancakes, we were happy. If it was a hamburger, yeah. we was happy. You remember my friend Steve from college? Yeah. Um, well, I one day I worked up this whole Hojo the clown routine with Steve, and we imagined an, an individual gone south, like a like, like somebody <laughs> who you know maybe drank and smoked and had a van. They drove up to they were rented out for parties. <laughs> It's Ojo here, kids. Come sit on my lap. <laughs> and we'll let the rest go from there. We, Steve and I used to have conniptions of laughter over our Hojo routine. Where is Steve? Do you ever um, hear from him or see him? I have, I have to check about. I should check on him on LinkedIn. I mean, he's doing some law work now. Uh, I have to really check in on him. He was, still is, I'm sure, a very funny guy. All right. Um, At the beginning of the show, we talked about an article that um, came out in the New York Times recently, and the headline reads, uh, Social Security opens to survivors of same-sex couples who could not marry, challenging a policy that limited survivors' benefits to married couples, even though some couples were legally barred from marriage, took years. Uh, This began with a couple, uh, Helen Thornton and Marjorie Brown, began dating in 1979 after a few months. Uh, They began living together, and over a three-decade period, they built a life with each other, 
bought a home in Olympia, Washington, took out loans together, shared a checking account, even raised a son whose birth certificate carried both their names. In 2003, Ms. Brown received the diagnosis of ovarian cancer. Uh, Ms. Thornton cared for her through her repeated rounds of chemotherapy and, chemotherapy and intensifying illness until she had passed uh, Ms. Brown at the age of 50 in 2006. Shortly thereafter, Ms. Thornton turned 60, the age at which widows and widowers, I did not know this, are eligible for survivor benefits from Social Security. She walked into the agency's local office carrying bank statements in the title to their house and applied. She figured and probably knew she would be rejected, but she did it anyways. And this began a legal battle that's been apparently going on for quite some time now. And only recently has the administration now said they now allow gay men and lesbians to receive survivor benefits if they can show that they were in a committed relationship and would have married had that been possible. Uh, the change could mean greater economic protection for a population that is more prone to high poverty rates than American adults overall. We've heard this from a number of people. So this couple in particular, her monthly benefit jumped up to 1849 and she received a backdated windfall of 72,000 for retroactive payments. She probably would have received had she been able to claim it. So the IRS claims they only know about 700 couples that have actually applied and tried the legal route to do this. And they've alerted them that they're available, but the article was interestingly pointing out that there's probably a lot of people who have absolutely zero idea that they can now do this, right? Yeah, and uh, the important part, as you said, so they, they did pay retroactively. There was another example they gave where the retroactive uh, payment was uh, 90,000. Yep. And in the case of uh, in the case of Thornton and Brown, it was uh, the, the benefit went from 953 a month up to the 1849. You know, I think the generation before us um, that wasn't uh, allowed to marry because it wasn't legal, so we weren't allowed to participate in all the same benefits rest of the rest of America could, that um, a lot of people were either embarrassed or shamed or closeted or hiding, right? So I, I wonder if, um, if more people would come forward if they knew. And I, that's why I was kind of pleasantly surprised that they said the, the Social Security Administration actually was actively... Trying, trying to, to go find through, them. Right, yeah. trying to find them and say, hey, you're entitled to these benefits, and which I thought was pretty remarkable for a government agency. Usually efficiency is not one of their key points. <laughs> it's not a hallmark. No, you're right. No. So, yeah, so I was, um, but I was, uh, you know, pleased to, pleased to read this. And I'm sure, I mean, talk about some, you know, somebody on a fixed income, you know, getting the 72000 or getting the 90000 back from uh from back uh, back money's owed or back money's due is, is a huge huge benefit for somebody on a fixed income or retirees, right? Yeah, and that, that the couple you're referring, the the two women, um, one of them worked as a high powered. She had a high powered job. I mean, she probably made a lot more money. Her partner was always working for charitable organizations and soup kitchens and took care of her till she passed away. She lost her job, had difficulty getting a new one, but because of that, her monthly benefit was like nine hundred dollars, and she. She said, you know, most people, if they're going to visit family, they book a ticket. I'm going to fly and see my family in California. She couldn't do that. It had to be thought out. She put off home maintenance. You know, you think about right. it, right? Painting the house or fixing gutters. Um, what I'm most intrigued by is, you know, when when the Supreme Court approved of marriage under uh, Anthony, when Anthony Kennedy was on the bench, um, this opened the door for a lot of us to get married. And one primary reason why gay couples wanted to get married wasn't necessarily to have a religious ceremony or they did want to get acknowledged in the eyes of their friends and peers and coworkers um, and have a party. But a lot of it revolved around financial considerations such as social security benefits. And if you, if you didn't have the protection of marriage, constructing how a couple was going to make you know, protect their assets. And you and I were dealing with this up until recently, Tim. I didn't think this would be, I didn't think marriage was going to be a possibility in my lifetime. I mean, we, no. we, Bob and I had all sorts of legal things drawn up to make sure that if one of us passed, the other was safely going to be able to stay in their home. That's a big one too, right? Right, right. But the one thing that you wouldn't have been able to do is if one of you had a higher payout for social Correct. security. Because um, what happens benefit. with, right, what happens with, uh, with um, different di male female relationships, I guess I don't know how to exactly phrase it. 
is whoever made the most money, the survivor, if is allowed to pick the benefit, right? If their yep. their spouse is passed with a larger amount of money. So, um, yeah, it was just simply, and and this is the the ongoing fight that, uh, of course, now we've got a new Supreme Court uh, pick that's going to uh, happen um, probably within the next couple months. Right now, that. Uh, Supreme Court uh, buyers. Well, uh, the Democrats wanted to move as fast as Amy Coney Barrett, and I don't see why it couldn't because she got rammed through right before the election. Mm. In fact, that whole, by the way, the whole dialogue around all of this, like, you know, Trump got three justices put through, and Amy Coney Barrett was uh, really should not have, to, you know, on Mitch McConnell's own logic. If she you follow, be, right, if you followed his logic, which you, you can't, right? But now we know that his logic is win at any cost and, and do whatever you say, do whatever you have to do to win at any cost. And that includes lying or changing your point of view or, um, you know, playing with language and saying, oh, I meant this. I didn't really mean that. Um, but they're afraid that with the 50-50 Senate, if something happens in the next few weeks or months before the yeah. confirmation, it could be, he could be denied the justice. Um, but uh you know, I wonder if privately in these meetings they they yell at each other. Like I if think I was in the to. Senate, if I was in the Senate, I'd probably get kicked out because on the floor I would say, you know what, Mitch, you're a jackass. Mm. You know, to, I I'm would... not allowed to talk like that. I guess like Ted Cruz and Hawley and some of these morons. Um, I, I'd go right at him, and that that's kind of why I liked Anthony Weiner. But you know, he got in trouble for <laughs> his Weiner <laughs> and and pictures. Cell phone pictures right, but, and, of yeah. his wiener, right? So, mm -hmm. but he, yeah. he, but he was one of the few that would just go right out and call out the hypocrisy. But it's like, well, my good friend on the right knows that this isn't really how things go. No, you're a jackass. Do you know I who know. I think might have had conversations like that? I maybe he was always spoken about as a really good-hearted man, but um, Harry Reid and Mitch McConnell probably had an interesting relationship. And I wonder if behind closed so. doors, he's like, look. You may be the majority leader and you said this and you did that. But, you know, but then someone recently wrote in an article in The Atlantic that, you know, what you see is what you get with Mitch McConnell. There is no mysterious philosophy. There's no deep, you know, plan. He's just all about operations and pulling the levers of the Senate. So it's kind of a weird one, right? It tells me all I need to know about Kentucky. <laughs> hey, we had a nice drive through the state. It was Beautiful it horse was not farm. a nice state. I don't think so. The grass needed yeah, cut. Is that where we went to Cracker Barrel? We went to Cracker Barrel. Mm -hmm. It was hot. It was muggy. We were learning Chinese that trip. Well, you were. I gave Ni up, hao. and you, you, we got Nihao out of it. So <laughs> you gave up. At you gave up a hundred miles in. We probably should. We probably should. Yeah, I was looking. And somebody said it's the most difficult language. Language for, period. Yeah. For, for so we probably over overreached. We we might have. <laughs> Maybe if we had Spanish or we would have French had a better something, yeah we, we would have, have had a better had time with it if we decide fun. to yeah if we decide to refresh our French and Spanish right. we would have probably had a much more fun time right than to think you and I were going to be fluent and 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 Mandarin by the time we got to Vegas but <laughs> it, it, that's what the Volkswagen commercial said right those yeah, yeah. two kids driving cross country in the Passat and next thing you know they got out in California speaking Spanish speaking but, Spanish yeah hey that was our that was our plan. Didn't happen to us now. But anyway, this this is a great article, and uh, you can Google, find more information out. But uh, if you are part of a, and uh, we know we have a number of um, retirees that listen to us as well as young folks, that uh, if you feel you may be entitled to these benefits, you should contact your Social Security office and uh, or Social Security Administration and find out if, in fact, uh, you can collect if you're eligible. I think that's a great thing. So good job, Mr. Nash. Public service announcement, I think, is what. Thank called, you. Right? Yeah. So, hey, thanks for joining us. Um, we're here every Wednesday at 1 p.m. East. You can also find our audio feed, which is released on Saturday mornings. You can find all the information about us at focusgroupradio.com. All of our media is housed there, including our podcast, which is TFG on Buttons, 20 minutes long, three stories, getting get out. And um, don't mess up your hair. <laughs> don't mess up your hair. And we want to thank our friends at Deep Discount. They're having a, uh, a sale going on right now revolved around uh, medical dramas and TV crime. And uh, I picked The Sopranos. John picked The Masters of Sex. And the new release this week is The Beatles' uh, Get Back. So it's uh, a great uh, documentary on uh, the making of music and the, the people of, uh, that made up the group, The Beatles, and all the people that were around them particularly as well. 
So everybody, have a great week and um, be sure to uh, don't text and drive, arrive alive. Stay safe and stay warm out there and we'll see you on Tuesday. It's The Focus Group with Tim Bennett and John Nash. Accessible on all platforms. Subscribe, like, and rate us on your platform of choice. Learn more at focusgroupradio.com. That was a stunning focus group.